Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses. And I believe the way that so many people will quote this verse, it's a lot of people's favorite verse. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measurement you measure, it shall be measured to you again. But why look you on the wood chip that is in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the bearing beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me cast out the chip from your eye? And behold, the beam in your own eye. Hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to cast out the wood chip out of your brother's eye. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the reading of this word. This word is quoted by so many people, but sometimes people quote things without understanding. Father, help us to understand this word and apply it rightly to our lives, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the the church today has become prosperous. In fact, as small and tiny as we are, we probably have far more wealth than most of the first century churches had. I'm sure we do. I'm, I'm sure as a, as a, as a uh, congregation, the, this church does, and then as individuals in the congregation, we have far more than most people in the early church ever thought of having. The church, at least in America, I'll say that, has become fat and has, by and large, forgotten about the Lord that died for her. The church has backslidden, and that's a, that's a popular term to be a backslider. And we need revival. We need it. And I believe that um, that revival will come, but at a great cost to American Christians. We have to turn our hearts back to our Savior. We have to align our hearts back to his heart. And this verse that we read this morning, this is coming from the heart of Christ. It's coming from the heart of God. You know, when God answers a prayer, we have to be careful. I know I have been praying for revival um, for my whole time of my life as a, as a Christian. And when I say that you have to be careful, the way that God chooses to answer things sometimes is a painful thing. So you better seek God more than you ever have done in your life. There were warnings to the early church about some of the same things that 
we're having problems with today in America. I would like for you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, the first four verses. I'm not going to read all of verse 1, but I will read the verses 2, 3, and 4. And I'm just reading the part of verse 1 that gives you an idea of who this is directed to. Unto the messenger, and by the way, that's what the word angel means. Angelo means messenger. And Malak in Hebrew, which is often translated as angel, it also means messenger. Unto the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus, write, I know your works, and your toil, and your endurance, and how you cannot support evil ones. And you put to trial those who declared themselves to be apostles, and are not, and did find them to be liars. And you did support, and have endured, and for my name's sake has toiled, and has not wearied. But I have against you that you did leave your first love. Those are sad words. Because, you know, one of the relationships between our Savior and us is groom to bride. Now, that's not the only one, and it's not used uh, very uh, often, but it is a popular way of viewing Christ's relationship with his church. And for someone to leave their first love the love that you had that drew you to marry a person. It's a very sad thing for both partners, but especially the one that still loves. You know, any relationship is going to go sour when a partner in that relationship begins thinking about themselves more than the other person. And that's when love grows cold. And, and I've seen this many times. Uh, sometimes it's where both people begin to think only about themselves. And usually things end, uh, they can end quickly that way or because they're so involved in themselves that they can go together for years and as long as they're happy in their in, in individual endeavors, uh, they can last a long time. Kind of depends. But the thing about it is that even the person that still loves, their love can grow cold. Now, fortunately for us as Christians, the love that Christ has for us is not going to grow cold. But the problem is, is that the love that his church has had for him, especially in this country, has grown cold. One of my prayers is, uh, every day I ask the Lord, please don't let my love for you grow cold. I don't want to be a disappointment to you when he comes back. But there's another church that I want us to look at. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to read the part of verse 14, just so that we can see uh, who this is addressed to, and then read the entirety of verses 15, 16, and 17. And to the messenger of the assembly of the Laodiceans, write, now verse 15, 
I know your works. Isn't it interesting how Jesus always knows? He knows. He knows everything about us. You can't hide it. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. Thus, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick is what he's saying. Because you say, I am rich and have grown rich and have need of nothing and do not know that you are a vagrant and pitiful and begging and blind and naked. I want you to look at that list there. Those are the literal translations of those words. I think there are a lot more. Uh, they speak more than the English choices. For example, look at that first one. You do not know that you're a vagrant. You know, the first thought that comes to my mind on that is, you know, a vagrant is somebody that does not have a home. Look at our country. People without homes. Right now, I don't know if you realize this, but they have, that the federal government has ordered all the different governments and the banking concerns and the, the mortgage people to not expel anybody from their home for missing payments on their mortgage. Do you know that that's what it is? Do you realize that's about to end? I think it's the end of July is when that, when that moratorium from expelling people ends. And if they don't extend it, there are suddenly going to be an awful lot of homeless people that had been making payments, but because of this so-called virus, that uh, they've lost their jobs. How many of them are going to be Christians? A vagrant is a person who doesn't have a place. But yet here is a church that is, Jesus is addressing as the members being vagrants. You're occupying a pew. What are you doing? <laughs> For the Lord. What does he want you to do? Are we obedient? That's really the real question. Are we obedient to him? The second one is pitiful. That's what the word means. It means to be pitied. Jesus looks at so many um, church members. I, I don't want to use the word Christian. I don't want to use the word believer. I'll just use the word church members. And they're pitiful. Oh, we may have nice clothes. We may drive a nice car. Or we just may have these things. We may have a home and everything else. Um, but he looks at us and he says, spiritually speaking, we are to be pitied. He says, you're begging. You said you were rich. You are beggars. I remember when I went to Israel. And uh, I was, I'm trying to remember how many blocks away that hotel was, but I, I had to walk everywhere. And, uh, and I was staying at the YMCA, which is across the street from the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. And I think I had, I think it was, for some reason the number six blocks stays in my mind. It, it was a ways. And when I got to the edge of the old city, there was this woman, very thin, sitting on the sidewalk, looked like her clothes were kind of ragged. Almost reminded me of going back to Jesus' day, the way that she appeared. And she was begging. And I gave her something. I don't remember what it was now, but I gave her something. Um, that picture 
of that woman comes to my mind when Jesus is saying here to the Laodicean church, you're a beggar. And you know, the sad thing is, we should be begging the Lord. We should be begging Him for His grace and mercy and to grow more like Him. But I don't think very many are. And then He said, you're blind. You can't see. And then He says, you're naked. That... The word naked in the Bible generally means shame. And it goes back to our original parents, Adam and Eve. They had no shame when they had not sinned, but when they had sinned, they discovered their nakedness. They were ashamed. Sin is a shame to any person. And when it is pointed out to us and we do nothing about it, we're living in shame. You see, the modern church, I believe, has gone beyond the Laodicean church that we are reading about here in Revelation. The Laodicean church was indifferent to Christ. That's what it means to be not neither cold nor hot. You're, you're not against him, and you're not for him. You're just indifferent. That was the Laodicean church. A lot of people say, well, the church today is Laodicean. Oh, I, I think we're beyond Laodicea. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus said, And because lawlessness shall have been multiplied... He's talking about the end time. The agape of the many will grow cold. The love of the many will grow cold. He's not talking about mankind. He's talking about the many, the church. That the love will grow cold because of lawlessness. We certainly are living in a lawless land. We're living in a lawless world. And the love of many, of the many, has grown cold. Well, the verse that we read from Matthew, I mentioned that, uh, that it's a favorite verse of people. I'm going to tell you what group of people it's a favorite verse of. It's the favorite verse of the backslider. It's the favorite verse of the backslider. I cannot think of a single verse that is more quoted by unbelievers than Matthew 7.1. I'm talking about folks that don't go to church and yet they know this one verse. Because the moment that a Christian may start to witness to a lost person, this comes up. See, I get in agreements. <laughs> Why is that? Well, first, it's a problem with what our heart sees or cannot see due to a beam that is blocking our vision. Some can't see that they judge other people in order to gain control of them. Now, Jesus was the shepherd of the flock that is his church. And, and he is more often referred to as a shepherd than the groom. Okay? Because that's really what he is. He's also the groom, but basically in heaven he's seen as the lamb that was slain for you and me. It was his responsibility among, for his disciples to take care of them, to teach them. And it was his responsibility that when his disciples would get out of line, spiritually speaking, 
It was his responsibility to bring them back into line. But it was not the Pharisees' responsibility. And you can read throughout the Gospels where the Pharisees would say, for example, the time that the, the disciples were walking through the edge of a field, and it happened to have been on the Sabbath. Now, you can walk a certain distance on the Sabbath, but no more than that, according to the Pharisees. Um, and the disciples were walking through the field, and they were hungry, and so they pulled some of the wheat or the barley off, stripped it off of the stalk, and they uh, rubbed the wheat in their hands, and that was kind of like making a little bit of, of bread. And the Pharisees accused the disciples, your, your, your disciples are making bread on the Sabbath. Well, what an absurd thing to say, but again, the Pharisees were absurd, and they were lost, and they were not righteous, although they had a lot of people fooled into thinking that they were. Some of them did turn to Christ, but not many. You see, the Pharisees were all about controlling people. They were bullies. They wanted to control people. You know, the, name, the word jurisdiction comes to mind. You know, uh, uh, police officers have jurisdiction. They have an area in which they are representing the law. But it's only a certain area. If they're a police officer for Elkland or Addison or, or any of these other places around here, uh, they can stop a person and pursue a person if the crime has been committed in, in their jurisdiction. But there are some things that are none of their business. It's somebody else's jurisdiction. And the issue about judging is a jurisdiction issue. In John chapter 21... Jesus had prepared a breakfast for his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. And when they had finished eating the loaves and the fishes, Jesus had a private conversation. A private conversation. I, I don't think any of the other disciples were there to hear what he had to say. With backslider Peter, now remember, Peter had backslidden. He had denied that he ever knew Jesus three times, and then he had run off, and he had gone back to being a fisherman. And Peter was told, feed my sheep, tend my little ones, my lambs take care of the flock. He was telling him what his responsibility was going to be. Well, then Jesus turned aside and he began talking to John. And it seems that Peter was suddenly wondering about one of these sons of thunder because that was the nickname Jesus gave to John and James, the brothers, uh, because they were the ones that uh, said, uh, Lord, this town didn't receive your word. Did we call down fire from heaven upon them? And I guess Jesus was rather amused at that, and he began calling them, where's the sons of thunder? <laughs> so Peter's saying, what about John? What is his responsibility? Well, the basic response of Christ was to tell Peter, what is that to you? In other words, Peter, that's none of your business. You know, you may want to know certain things, I may want to know certain things, but you and I do not have a right to know things. And the only business that we are to mind is that which has been assigned to us. And for me as a pastor, you're part of my assignment. 
So you are part of my business, okay? Here's a prime example of a total backslider wanting to use Matthew 7, 1, this verse about judging. You see, the Pharisees kind of fit this. They were gleeful if Jesus or any one of his disciples were to fail. And you see, at, at Jesus' crucifixion, the Pharisees said, Ah, he failed, he failed. No, he was fulfilling what he was sent here to do. But to them, they thought he had failed. And in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, we read this. And one of the Pharisees, now this is a Pharisee, this is before uh, Jesus was crucified, but one of the Pharisees had asked him that he should eat with him. They invited him home to, for a meal. And having entered into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at table. And by the way, that's how they, they didn't have chairs, they didn't sit at tables like we do today. They reclined on pillows. That was the Roman way. That was everywhere in the world. That, that's how they ate. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, having known that he, that's Jesus, had reclined in the Pharisee's house, having taken an alabaster box of unguent or perfume and standing at his feet behind him, weeping and began to rain his feet with tears and that's the word rain she was crying so much that it looked like rain and was wiping them with the hairs of her head and was ardently kissing his feet she was strongly kissing his feet. I mean, there was no way he could miss this. In fact, there was no way anybody in the room could miss what she was doing. And was anointing them, his feet, with the unguent, with the perfume. But when the Pharisee who invited him, having seen, he spoke within himself, saying, and this is what the Pharisee is thinking, this one, referring to Jesus, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what the woman is that touches him, for she is a sinner. In other words, she was uh, quite possibly a prostitute. And this Pharisee would never have let any prostitute come near him, let alone touch him. Well, Jesus, right after this verse, and this is verse 39, I'm not going to read the parable, I'm just going to summarize the parable. He tells about a person who is in debt. And, uh, and he asked the Pharisee a question about who would be more grateful, the person that had been forgiven a big debt or the person that had been forgiven a little debt. So picking up in verse 43, Simon, and this is not Simon Peter, this is a Simon of Pharisee. Simon answered and said, I take it that he to whom he forgave more would love more, is what he said. And he, that's Jesus, said unto him, You have rightly judged. And there's that word, judged. Simon, you've made the correct evaluation. That's what the word judge means, is to evaluate. You have rightly judged. In verse 44, And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, <clears throat> but she has rained my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss. 
in that day it was like the French you know how you go up and the French will kiss you on both cheeks or they used to I probably nobody does that anymore with this so-called virus you gave me no kiss but she from the time I came in ceased not ardently kissing my feet my head with oil you did not anoint but she has anointed my feet with perfume for which cause I say to you her many sins have been forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven well, he loves little kind of wonder if he was looking at Simon deep in the eyes when he said that and he said Jesus said to her your sins have been forgiven and those reclining with him began to say within themselves, in their minds, in their hearts, Who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There was no condemnation for her because she recognized that Jesus is the Messiah the Savior, the Son of God. And she knew that. And she was grateful to Him that He came to this earth for her. You see, some people, while I said earlier that they use judging to control people, some use condemnation in order to clear their own name. I know we've seen that before. Look in Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Paul says, For we dare not rank among or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But these measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves with themselves do not understand. You see, there were religious leaders uh, that were uh, in, in the church or trying to get their way into the church back then, and we still have them today. And they would compare themselves with themselves and they say, look how good I am. See, I'm good. I know I'm good. So you should see that I'm good too. And Paul said, we don't do that. <laughs> and he's referring to himself and Timothy and Silas and, and the group that he would travel with. Uh, we don't do that. It, what he's saying is, and, it, and he's doing, he's talking about something that politicians do. Uh, politicians love to try to make their opponent look bad, hoping that that will make themselves look good. And there's lots of folks that are religious that will want to make somebody else look bad, especially if they've been caught in a sin and they don't want to admit it and so they will run down the other person so there are these things that happens when our heart cannot see because there is a beam blocking our vision and and I think I failed to mention this in those words that Jesus used back in Matthew 7 about a beam blocking a vision and a wood chip in the eye, that really shows you that, that this illustration was coming from a carpenter. Okay? Uh, we know that in one of the Gospels, I believe it's in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus identifies himself as having been a carpenter because that's what Joseph did. And um, you can imagine that when you're planing wood and they didn't have safety glasses back then, 
that a chip of wood could get in your eye, and Jesus knew how painful that would be to get a chip of wood in your eye. But the beam, do you know what the word beam means? The word that he uses for a beam is a large timber that is supporting either the roof or the floor of a building. That big. We might use the word a column. A column that is holding up a floor. There's Underneath this floor, there are columns holding this floor up. And Jesus is saying, you have a little chip in your eye, uh, in, in your brother's eye, but you have a column in your own. How on earth are you going to be able to get that little chip out of his eye when you've got a whole column in your own? And so he's, he's telling us these things, and, and he's talking about judging and condemnation. But the question is, is it ever good that a judgment be made? Because you see, a lot of people that will quote Matthew 7, 1, uh, especially if you're telling them that they need to repent of something, or, or they need to trust Christ as their Savior, uh, they know that they do, but they will try, oh, they're, they're the ones that actually have a column in their eye and they're trying to get the little chip out of yours. Yes, it is, the Bible does call for judgment. It's called discernment. Discernment. It's the spiritual gift a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to believers to discern. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And you see, this is why Matthew 7 so often gets misapplied and misused. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. What's a natural man? Natural man is a person that's lost. They've not been born again. They do not know God. They do not know his son. They do not have the Holy Spirit in them. When we start talking as Christians about spiritual things, well, we're just fools to them. But the spiritual, verse 15, but the spiritual ones discern all things, not some things. A spiritual person, a, a person that's filled with God's Spirit, that's born again, you can discern not some things, but all things. But he is examined by no one. You see, for us as believers, the examining is going to be done by the Lord, and he does a very thorough job, I will tell you, out of personal experience. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but Dokumazate the spirits if they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now I did not speak in tongues just then. I just said the Greek word. The, the, the English word is usually put there is test. But this particular word dokumazate means to test a metal for its purity. So, Christians are to test the spirit of another person as to its purity. Is this the pure word of God coming through this person? Is this the work of the Holy Spirit? Or is it this own person's spirit? Or perhaps is this person possessed? And by the way, I have seen 
people who were possessed before. Okay, so judgment is part of the spiritual gifts of the spirit to Christians, spiritual gift of discernment. But there is another place where judgment is called for, and that is in discipleship, where you are a leader of a group of people, or you are the head of household. Joshua chapter 24, going back to the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now then, fear Jehovah and serve him in sincerity and in truth and turn away from the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Jehovah. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve Jehovah, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods from your whom your fathers served which were beyond the river those Egyptian gods or the gods of the Amorites which is the other direction in whose land you are dwelling that's, a, that's where modern day Jordan is today but as for me and my house we will serve Jehovah so, a leader or a head of a house, if you're the husband and you have a wife and children, or if you don't have any children, you have a wife, you're still the head of the house. Discipleship calls for judgment, discernment, calling things right and wrong. And then the last one is to keep others from falling into sin and condemnation. Now, here's what the, what the hypocrite will say. Genesis chapter 4 verse 9 is one of the earliest hypocrites we've got, Cain. And Jehovah said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know, which was a lie, am I my brother's keeper? You see, a lot of people will say, Well, you're sticking your nose into my business by bringing up Jesus to me. I'm not your keeper and you're not my keeper. That's what the hypocrite says. But this is what we are instructed as believers and this is that verse in Galatians that I mentioned to you earlier. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man even be overtaken in some offense, have you offended somebody? Okay. If a man even be overtaken in some offense, you, the spiritual ones, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Don't come and tell them, oh, well, I've never committed that sin, because we probably have. Don't come from an attitude of superiority, but meekness. Considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear you one another's cargo weights and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Now I know that the English version says burden, but it also says burden down, I think it's in verse 6. And those words that are translated burden mean two different things. You see, there are going to be times where we run into somebody and they have a weight that they cannot bear. It's like the weight of a ship's load. Can you imagine those great big ships that we see at ports and they're just stacked up high with all of these loads and it's, it's just train car after train car after train car of, of loads of goods and materials. That's a load that's too heavy for one person to bear. Help bear their load. But then at the end of that verse, Paul says, but every man has to carry his own load. And that's the backpack. Okay? There's a difference between trying to carry a semi-trailer on your back and a backpack on your back. We all have a, a load we have to bear but we're supposed to help one another. 
And part of helping somebody is to keep them from falling into condemnation and sin. And that's part of judging. Here is what our prayer needs to be. Because I know you're thinking, okay, well, what do I do? How can I tell these things? Well, let me conclude with this. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. When you're con- confronted with some kind of an issue where the, you know you need to say something, pray this prayer, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if any wicked way is in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, we got to get that beam out of our eye first before we can help anybody else. And if there is a beam there, it needs to be gotten out before we help them. So pray that prayer. And if we let God be our judge, He will see to it that the road we are on is straight and it's not crooked and we can be a genuine help to other people. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You for what You do for us and we pray You help us to be this kind of help to others, whether they're believers or not. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.